you can see that the assault rate, 18.6%, is low for Israel. They're in rank order. Number one tops is Iran. 77% uh, of the relationships in this study involved in assault. Uh, these are the high countries, these are the low countries. Israel is, is low, 18.6, compared to the average across all 32 countries, 31%. So it's, it's half the average rate. But although the assault rate is low, the di dyadic types follow the typical pattern in Israel as elsewhere, 62% both. Uh, the percent male only is lower. The percent female only is somewhat higher than typical. Well, that's about typical. If you run down this, 27%. The only place where female only is not very high is when, as in a country like Iran, where almost all, they're both doing it. 90, 94% both. It's a violent country. Everyone's violent. Now you may have realized from the slides I've just shown you that dyadic types are remarkably consistent. That the both assault is almost always the predominant type. And the sole perpetrator type is typically about evenly split between male only and female only. This is worldwide. You get the same results regardless of how the data were gathered. Whether you interview men to find out or women, the results are almost identical. Whether it's self-report or partner's report, you get that typical just over half, both, uh, and then the rest divided about equally between male only and female. Or parents reporting, or children reporting about what went on between their parents when they lived at home. It's also consistent, as you just saw, across levels of severity. And uh, whether it's dating or married couples, it's just, as I said, remarkably consistent. Now, although the results almost always show about half the cases are both doing it. There's an aspect of this which is not symmetrical. Women experience about two-thirds of the injuries, and in the United States and Canada, two-thirds of the deaths when it's a murder committed by a partner. So the victimization rate is much greater for women than men. And that means when we're dealing with services for victims as compared to prevention programs and treatment programs, women have to have priority because they are two-thirds of the victims. And I've been saying this for many years, but my critics don't pay any attention to the fact that I've been pointing this out. For example, in the 1980 book, uh, I said, even though wives are also violent, they are also in the weaker, more vulnerable position. And that applies not only to physical uh, assaults, but to psychological attacks and economic deprivation. So as far as victim services, as compared to treatment and prevention, priority needs to be given to the predominant victims. So, well, that, the fact that women are more often injured than killed doesn't change in the least the fact that they also attack about the same, same percentages attack as do male partners. Okay, let me turn to the question and uh, does use of dyadic types help provide for greater understanding of the causes and effects of partner violence? And later on I'll get to as a basis for treatment and prevention. 
So the first issue I'll look at is intergenerational transmission. And I'll present this and another slide on that. The both assault type is associated with the highest probability of the children when they're grown up assaulting a partner. You can see when the parents, when both the parents are violent, there's a 50% chance that the children will also assault a partner. That's a huge intergenerational transmission. Physical abuse of children, for example, do physically abuse children, abuse their own children? Yes, there it's only about 30%. So this is an even stronger effect than we know from physical abuse studies. Uh, if it's the father only, for some reason, which I don't understand, is less intergenerational than when it's mother only. Now, that previous study uh, was not a study of mine, it's by some other researchers. Here's one of, from one of my studies. Here are the dyadic types along the bottom, father only, mother only, both. And what percent of their children assaulted a partner? Well, you can see that the highest assault rates are in this both assault column. For both men and women, having both parents assault each other is associated with the greatest probability of the children also doing it when they're in a relationship. That's not surprising. Um, what's more, somewhat more interesting is the fact that this applies to both men and women, and that the, f the for women, the greatest risk occurs when it's the mother is the only one. There's a sex of parent by sex of child effect. For men, the greatest risk occurs when it's the father is the only one. So it's, the children tend to replicate the pattern of the same sex parent more than others. What about theft, stealing money? It won't come in as any news to this group that men steal more than women, larger proportion of men. Uh, that's the upper line. This is the percent who stole money, the upper line for men, and the lower line a lower percentage of women. But the relationship of the dyadic type to the child engaging in this crime as an adult, young adult, is greatest when both parents uh, are assaulted. When it's uh, the father only, and the father only doesn't make that much difference for women. Mother only makes a little increase for men, the father only, makes a bigger difference than the mother only. Again, the sex of the parent by sex of child effect. What about depression? Oh, this is a study I'm doing in collaboration with Zev Winstock of Haifa University. Um, there's an interesting gender pattern here. Although the results are, are cross-sectional, the interactions with gender suggest that both victimization and perpetration cause depression. So if we take men, the almost as high as men who uh, assault is men who are both assaulting is men who are the only perpetrators. For women, the highest depression rate occurs when women are the only uh, perpetrators. In general, I, this is cross-sectional data, so talking about cause and effect is uh, an opinion, a judgment, not real evidence. But in general, it suggests that Perpetration is associated with assault 
as with perpetration is associated with depression as well as being a victim. So why is that? Why is being a perpetrator associated with depression? I think it's because depressed people tend to be more aggressive than other people. There's now quite a bit of research showing links between depression and aggression, and it shows up here. Um, finally, you can apply dyadic types to a great many things, any relationship variable. Here I've applied it to corporal punishment, to smacking kids. Is it both parents who smack, or just the father, or just the mother? So, um, and what's the effect of corporal punishment on the child's psychological well-being? Well, here the effect uh, I looked at is depression. And um, you can see that compared to the no corporal punishment, the depression scores are always higher. Women have the highest depression scores, as shown in most other studies. Corporal punishment by mother has a slightly stronger effect and corporal punishment by father, <laughs> and being hit by both parents is the largest risk factor for being depressed as an adult. So you can see in each of these examples, knowing who's doing it, whether it's in partner relationships or in parent-child relationships, makes a difference. We need to attend to who's doing it as well as whether it happened. Okay, these results and sorts of results, not in the form of dyadic types, with a few exceptions, have been known for 30, 40 years. And um, they've been ignored, concealed, or denied. And how was that, how did that happen? What methods were used to hide it? Well, many methods. I'll give, I'll give you a few examples. Others are in these two papers. Method one, simply omit the results showing female perpetration from the published article or report. The first instance I came across of this was a 1977 survey of the population, a survey of general population survey of women in Kentucky. Only women are interviewed, but the questions asked not only were they victims, but did they do it? Did they, did their partner hit them, and did they hit the partner? When that report was published, only assaults by women were reported. The approximately equal rate of assault, well, only assaults by men were reported. The approximately e equal rate of assault by women never appeared in the, the study. Um, I, I know this because they used the conflict tactic scale, and I asked for a copy of the data set, which fortunately they provided to me. But, so I could run the analysis myself and found equal rates of perpetration, even though the published report was it's only women as victims. That's continued to this day. It's still the practice. Here's a 200, 2012 study sponsored by one of the largest foundations supporting uh, prevention and treatment efforts in uh, uh, social affairs, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, conducted by Research Triangle International, one of the most respected survey research firms in the United States. They conducted a survey of dating violence by middle school students as part of an evaluation of a prevention program in several U.S. cities. The 2012 news release deliberately omitted figures for boys and girls separately. How do I know it was deliberate? I called the person 
in charge of the study and talked with her, Sherry Miller. And she said, yes, it's unfortunate that that happened, and, but agreed to provide the data. Uh, but she was overruled by the people at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Here's a, here's a specific example by one of America's leading criminologists, Lester Kennedy, who was dean of the School of Criminology at Rutgers University, uh, and Donald Dutton of uh, University of British Columbia. The pre-publication version, which I have a copy of, uh, has three rows of data, husband and wife, wife to husband, and couple. They're both the couple isn't, uh, well, I won't get into explaining that. Um, the published version has only two panels of data. The wife uh, to husband data was simply not published. Why? Because Les Kennedy, it was, the news about this study circulated around the University of Alberta, where he was at the time, and uh, there was a protest, a demonstration, a protest about disseminating lies. That's, those are the words used, disseminating lies. And they organized a public hearing. But Kennedy simply didn't want to put up with that. So he called, got it called off by agreeing to publish only the data on male to female assaults. Method two is to only ask the questions about male perpetrator, perpetration. That guarantees 100% male perpetration. That was done in the Canadian National Violence Against Women, and now has been done in about 30 countries participating in the World Health Organization multi-nation survey of violence against women. When I talk to people at the World Health Organization about that, they say, well, this survey is about violence against women, period. As though that answered the question. Uh, they simply remove, they use the conflict tactics scales, which asks about what the respondent's partner did as well as what the respondent, but they remove the questions on what the respondent did, the women respondents. Method three is selective citation. By scholars, there are hundreds of articles that cite the only survey which shows a much higher percent of male offenders. There's many surveys that show male offenders, but they don't ask about female offenders. But of surveys that should ask about both, the only one which shows a much higher percent of male offenders is the U.S. National Crime Victimization. It's an outlier, and there are good reasons why that's the case. Relying on that ignores the more than 200 studies which have found about the same percent of women as men assault a partner. When those 200, any of those 200 or more studies are mentioned, almost inevitably uh, they say, well, some studies show this, but they're not valid. You can't believe them. So you get uh, sort of proof by citation, not proof by evidence, by citing several articles which make the same claim but present no evidence. So, in the service world, this is utterly standard. Here's just a few days ago an announcement about Europe's most advanced treaty against domestic violence. And who's illustrated as a victim? A woman. Women are victims, but they're also perpetrators, and we're not going to end violence against women until we also address violence by women. 
Here's another recent example. The mayor of Dallas, Texas, there was a huge um, uh, rally. Again, to come back to domestic violence at a football stadium in Dallas, so you can get, gather how many people were there. And the mayor called on the men of Dallas to change their attitudes towards domestic violence. And he said, you can call a guy who hits a woman a lot of things, but you cannot call him a man. He didn't also say, you can call a woman who hits a, a male partner a lot of things, but you can't call her a woman. Um, it's just, in the service world, this is the total story, and it's totally false. Move on. Now, method four is to just deny the evidence. One of the most, one of the most common methods of denying the evidence is say, well, it's different when women do it. It's self-defense. But is it? Here are eight or nine studies, and you can see that the typical pattern, 46% of the cases, the, the female partner was the first to hit. In some, in 77%, she was the first to hit. It goes as low as 21%. But typically, across many studies, of which these are just nine, it's about women are about as likely to be the first to hit as men. Another method of denial is to draw conclusions contradicted by the researcher's own results. I have five or six examples of this. Here's the most recent one by Edward Gondorf, who's a leading researcher. Uh, his, he studied batter intervention programs in four U.S. cities. Five, 563 couples. It's probably the most comprehensive study ever done of better intervention programs. And the issue he addressed in this article, which appeared just a few months ago in the journal Violence Against Women, is do assaults by female partners increase the probability of the male partner reoffending? Something I've argued for years. And he himself says that the reason he conducted this study, this analysis, to show that Strauss is wrong on this, because I've said that the biggest single risk factor for a woman being assaulted by a partner is whether she hits him. Uh, same thing for men, too, but no one objects to that. Um, and he concludes that violence by the female partners was relatively low. If you count 66% as relatively low, then you have to agree with it. Uh, and does not appear to influence the program outcomes in terms of men's reassault. This is a quote from page 10. Well, he calculated the percentages incorrectly. I think it was probably just a mistake, not deliberate. But he was he's so transfixed by the idea that this is a male-only crime, that he missed his own mistake. Uh, the, the, the rule is called percentaging in the causal direction, and you can find it in uh, several textbooks. Uh, when I did run the percentages in the causal direction, then I found that when using Gandalf's own data, when, when the female partner was violent, 80% of the men in this treatment program reoffended. Huge reoffense rate, 80%. When the female partner was not violent, not only 19% reoffended. So that's important, 19% did, even if a woman is not violent, she still has a one out of five chance of being assaulted. But it's not 80% chance. So assault by female partners was associated with a four times greater probability of being a victim of violence. 
And then the last method is simply deny what a huge amount of research shows uh, to shows to be correct is false, to say that's wrong. Um, here's examples from a recent, it's a beautifully done video from which I've taken these clips. Uh, it's very effective. It's uh, called, I've forgotten what it's called, but this video contains example after example over simply denying the evidence and insisting on the single causal factor patriarchy theory. So, the opening scene is, the reason I'm here is because I want to know why domestic violence is. Is it anger issues? No, the voice booms out. No, it's not anger. That's probably the best established proximate cause. I know of no study which investigated anger that didn't find it was at or near the top of the list. So, no. Okay. Is it stress? No, booms out the voice on this video. Again, there's so much evidence showing that under stress, people are more, both men and women, are more likely to be violent. It just flies in the way, you know, it's like, well, people, just have it hard to believe, just like when we first learned that the Earth revolves around the Sun, not the Sun revolving around the Earth. People said, that's crazy. Uh, not true. Um, is it drugs? Is it alcohol? No. I have a whole series of these pictures is it arguments? <laughs> no, it's not arguments. Um, so what is it then? Finally, it gets to the slide. What is it? It's a pattern of power and control. Yes, I totally agree. That's an important, very important factor. But putting it this way denies the multitude of other causes that are also there. And it fails to recognize that women use almost all the same coercive control tactics and about to the same extent as men. And how does it end? It says, ditch that jerk. <laughs> now that is sometimes the only solution. And uh, it needs to be kept in mind. But it's rarely what the victim wants and it denies the possibility of both changing. Okay, why have these results been ignored or concealed or denied? It's because the predominant theory is what I call the patriarchy theory. Patriarchy theory has been stated very succinctly in, in the, this quote. Domestic violence is a gender-specific behavior that means it's not women, gender specific. We know which gender they're talking about. It's a gender specific behavior which is socially and historically constructed. Men are socialized to take control and to use physical force when necessary to maintain dominance. Well, that definition implies two false assumptions that cripple, literally cripple, treatment programs and prevention programs. That's why study after study shows that those programs don't have any higher rate of preventing recidivism than comparison control groups. So the, the first of these two, as I've said before, that men are usually the only perpetrators. That cripples the program because they can't address half the problem, which is assaults by women. And that the fundamental cause is patriarchy. That cripples the program because patriarchy is important, but it's only one of many risk factors for partner violence. And, oh, well, I've said that. As a result of this pattern, and I, 
there's not a it's not a conspiracy in the sense that there's a central organization doing this or that. It's belief commitment. People believe this because it's knowing one of the reasons is that in all other crimes, men do it much more than women, especially violent crimes. So it's hard to understand. It's it's discordant with data on other crimes. And there's a bunch of other reasons. Whatever the reasons, as a result, much information currently reaching lawmakers and the public regarding domestic assault, while presented as scientific fact, is actually false, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Just plain false. Well, now what about Israel? I don't claim to know the research and political situation on this in Israel, but I'm fortunate in having collaborated with two Israeli researchers um, and know about their research, which suggests that concealment and denial also occurs in Israel. Here's the first national survey of on domestic violence in Israel, conducted by Svi Ivakovitz, Zev Winstock, and Gideon Fishman. And I'm, I've co-authored articles with Zev Winstock and working on some other research with him, so uh, it was a little bit difficult for me to hold him up as an example of this. Uh, he's also an awful nice person. Uh, but Again, because this, he was simply following what the Ministry of Labor and Welfare required of him. They wanted a study of violence against women and children and gave this group the money to do it. And no comparable questions on female violence against men were asked. I have some data on how good their estimates of the prevalence are, but I'll skip that and unless someone brings it up later. So that's one example. The other example is uh, in, a study, uh, in this study, which says the experience of violence as perceived by those who experience it, namely battering men and battered women. Those are the ones who experience violence. Battering men and battered women. No mention of women who assault. But she ignored her own previously published study, um, which found that battering men and battered, it contradicts that. It's a study of 465 students in Israel dating couples, and which found no significant difference between the percent of women and men who assaulted a partner. 28% of the men assaulted 25% of the women, about the same percent. So that was an article published several years before, three years before this one, and the results are ignored. Okay, what can be done about the cover-up in Israel? Research, a new national survey is needed to provide the basis, a factual basis, for national policy. Obviously, I'm going to recommend using the conflict tactics scale as being a co-author of that instrument, uh, but many others can be used. They just have to ask it in a gender equal way. Uh, the CTS, however, has demonstrated reliability and validity worldwide and, and makes it easy to create the dyadic types. It also provides data on negotiation. It makes a difference if both partners are willing to negotiate things, or if only the male partner is willing to negotiate, or if only the female. The same thing for injury, psychological aggression, and sexual coercion. Dyadic types can be created for all five of those. So if the results turn out for this hypothetical new national, Israel National Survey, turn out to be, as in the rest of the world, which I think they would, will turn out that way if the study's ever done, uh, 
then it would be the basis for new national policy to replace the current focus on gender and patriarchy as the primary problem, with Run recognizing that both assault is the most frequent type in Israel as in the rest of the world. That female only is about as prevalent, or for young people, university student couples, more prevalent than male, than male only. And that partner assault is the dyadic process involving a host of uh, behaviors, such as poor relationship skills. And then prevention programs to uh, address to address the prevention programs to girls and women, as well as men and boys. Um, I, I'd suggest starting in any school, starting that program with a 10-minute survey completed by the students. The results are almost certain to show high rates, high rates and high rates by girls as well as boys. And that will provide data from their own experience which will make, I think, will make the prevention program more realistic uh, and more effective. What about treatment? This is the last slide. <laughs> um, well, I think identifying dyadic types of participant on intake is an absolutely essential first step. You have to know who's doing it in order to treat it. But in the United States, not only is that not done, but anyone who tries to do otherwise. If a man in, in one of these programs says, yeah, I did that, and it was wrong, but you have to take into account that she was hitting me. If he insists that that's the truth, then he's treated as a liar, as being evasive, not cooperating, and he's typically sent back to court for sentencing. So uh, it's the opposite of using dyadic types on intake to see what treatments who should, and how the treatment should be addressed. And then, uh, since if this is a multiple caused, multiply caused phenomenon, there need to be diagnosis for a variety of risk factors. Male dominance certainly is one of them, but just one, such as what I've been talking about now, assault by a partner, anger management skills. That all those anger management studies have, are ignored, borderline personality, stressful conditions. Those are things that can be diagnosed on intake so that one can know how to address what treatment modalities to use. And the treatment programs themselves need to be drastically redesigned to address all the causes, not just male dominance. I mean, the, the, the Duluth power and control wheel, for example, is very important. All of those things need to be addressed. But right now, they're addressed only when men do it, not when women do it. And women do all those things as often as men. And that's simply ignored. Um, and many of the female partners need treatment as much as the presenting offender, not just for their violence, but also many other problems. In Gondolf's study, for example, 24% had a severe alcohol or drug problem. That needs to be addressed for their own sake, not just to end violence. So this would be a major undertaking with major benefits. My guess is there's only a small probability of it happening. Uh, but if it does, the benefits of recognized the dyadic nature of partner violence are likely to be less violence against women and also reduced mental health problems, better marriages, and children with fewer problems. Thank you. I don't know if time permits, but I'd be very glad to answer questions and hear comments.
time permit. Just time permit. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. We have five minutes for anyone to raise any question, make a comment. Yes. Yes. something for one of you to investigate. It stand, as you point out, it stands out. Okay, thank you. The question was, usually the distribution of dyadic types is about half both, and the remaining half about the same percent of women only as men only. But in the Israel example, and slide four on the first page, um, the female only is much higher than the male only. It's 20, uh, 28% compared to 10. And why is that? I'm glad I'm in Israel. I can say, well, that's for you to investigate, because I don't know. And it's, an, it's a very important issue. Yeah. Now, it could be. It could be that that's a fluke, and it's measurement error, sampling error for that particular sample uh, in this room. Right? Is there any other other questions, comments? Yes. So, uh, the same chart. I think this might be a mistake. It says dyadic salt types between parents of university students. Are you talking about the parents or about the students themselves? Uh, number five, slide number five. That's the parents. It's the it's the student's report of what happened between their parents. Okay. They completed the conflict tactic scale twice. Once for themselves and their dating partner if they were in, in a relationship. But before that, they answered those questions about the parents. And this is the student's report of what happened between the parents. And it's part of, as I said, dyadic types are highly consistent. It doesn't matter if you ask the parents themselves, if you ask their children, if you ask men, if you ask women, you get about the same results. So slide number six is also about the parents? Uh, slide six. The one that compares all the countries. Um, yes. No, that's about the student relationships. That's dating relationships. Slide, slide six is about dating relationships. And you can see it's, if you take it all together, it's about the same. Most are both. Yes? Yes. Um, in New York, uh, and I think in many places around the United States, police departments have policies to identify the primary aggressor when police go to a domestic conflict situation. Do you think that emphasizing the search for the primary aggressor is partly a fault for this one-sided focus? And would you discourage that approach? Because the opposite way of thinking is that um, victims will be reluctant to call the police if they fear arrest. Well, the question was about, in the United States, in most jurisdictions, there, they, when a, an arrest is made or when there's uh, prosecution, they take into account what's called the primary aggressor. Who's at fault implicitly? Um, and that is important. The tr there's two problems with that, probably more than two problems, but two that I think of at the moment. One is that in most other areas of law of assault, it doesn't matter 
though a judge and jury might decide, but according to the law, if someone hits you and you hit them, even though they were the first to hit, that's still an assault. That rule of law was overturned by these primary aggressors. Now, what's bad about that is that, and is recognized by the standard law of assault, is that when there's an assault, we need to treat whoever is assaulted. Either treat them criminally or treat, uh, treat them with therapeutic help. Um, the second thing that's wrong is that the questions used, the criteria, are f many biased. In many states, it's, it lists characteristics of the primary aggressor. And it also almost always says who's bigger and heavier and stronger, phrased indifferently. I don't know if that's true in New York. It's certainly true in Maine. I attended a training session, and there was no doubt at that training session that when the lecturer was referring to primary aggressor, he was referring, this was a police officer, he was referring to men and only men. The, the primary aggressor will emerge because as a, a kind of unintended consequence of something the women's movement advocated for a long time. And we owe it to the women's movement that public attention is being paid to this. And they advocated arresting offenders. The International Association of Chiefs of Police Training Manual until 1977 advised police officers to avoid getting involved in domestic disturbances. And then it went on for two or three pages, which essentially said, separate the warring parties and get out of there as fast as possible. That was the, the rule until 1977 when the manual, under pressure from the women's movement, was fortunately changed. Uh, to what came to be either preferential arrest or required arrest. The unintended consequences of that, the intended consequence was to get this crime treated as a real crime, which is great. But the unintended consequences, since women assault as much as men, was that the percent of women who were arrested for partner violence went up from a tiny percent to, in the U.S. nationally, about a quarter. And people in the women's movement said that's just wrong. It must be male backlash. Uh, uh, they still refused to accept that women do this too. And so they carried out a national campaign to get primary aggressive rules in force. And the primary aggressive rules are biased to arresting men, not women. Is that... Thank you.